Better System Trader, Episode 11. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Welcome to the Better System Trader podcast, episode 11. I'm your host, Andrew Swanscott. This week, we're talking about one of the most important components to trading, that is money management. Anyone who's done some research into money management will recognize our guest today because he is an authority on position sizing in trading. He's also a trading system expert, programming trading systems for fund managers, sovereign wealth funds, and staking systems for professional gamblers since the early 1980s, even working as a personal programmer to legendary traders like Larry Williams. He has written numerous books and professional papers on money management for trading and introduced new statistical techniques that are in widespread use throughout the industry today. Today we talk about position sizing, how to choose a position sizing model that suits you, optimal F, the curve and how it can be used not just for maximum growth but other applications too. We also discuss the risk of multiple strategies in a portfolio, dynamic position sizing, Martingale strategies, and how his views on money management have changed in the past 25 years. He also gives us some insights into how Larry Williams achieved a 11,000% return in the World Cup Trading Championships of 1987. This episode is invaluable for anyone risking money in the markets, so let's get to it. Today's guest is Ralph Fintz. Hope you enjoy it. Hi Ralph, thanks for joining us today. Hi Andrew. Anyone who's done some research into uh, position sizing or money management would have come across your work. So can you give us a little bit of background into how you started out in the industry? Well, I actually got a job as a margin clerk uh, before uh, before margin on, on accounts that were okay. The trade short option positions were computerized. It was actually done by hand for a while. And that's... Uh, Kind of a baptism by fire, but that's the short story of how I got into it. And one thing led to another, and I've been very lucky. And I found myself working as a programmer for Larry Williams a few years later. And he was in the uh, Robins World Cup 1987 championship. We also had some managed accounts at the time, and there was some disparity in the performance of those. And at the same time, we were trying to implement the Kelly criterion in his World Cup trading. And there were some things I noticed about that that really didn't make it applicable to trading that I was trying to solve. And the solution to that was also the solution to the disparity we were seeing in some of the managed accounts. So that's how I got into the trading business and how I got uh, kind of turned in the direction of money management. And, and, and the farther along that line I got, the more of an obsession it became, and uh, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, I think 1987 World Cup uh, Trading Championship, was that the year that Larry did a 1,000 plus percent return? Yeah, I think we had about a 900 percent drawdown in there too, but he, <laughs> he took $10,000 to uh, o- over a million, and it was, it, it was a wild ride, but he did it, and it was, it was very impressive. <laughs> okay, I might come back to that later and ask you about that a bit more. But just to start off with, I'd like to start with a few basic questions before we move into the more advanced stuff. So how important is position sizing in a trading model? Uh, well, I mean, to me, and <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm biased this way because as, as I said, it's, it's an obsession to me. But I, I believe it's the single biggest factor uh in anyone's trading, probably the most overlooked. Uh, it tends to not be as interesting as looking at price charts and price patterns and if you bought here and sold there. But in terms of uh, the, the importance on one's bottom line, I, I think it's second to none. Right. And I suppose um, there are a number of position sizing options out there. Uh, what factors do you need to consider when choosing one that suits you? Well, I always say there's there's really... There's three of them, but they're really directed towards one. And, and the single most important thing is criterion. What, what criterion criteria are you seeking to satisfy? 
uh, in your trading. If you're if you're looking to to, to shoot the lights out, uh, as Larry did in 1987, that's one criteria. You might have a, a different criteria. You might say, I want to get the greatest return I can without exceeding a 20% drawdown. You might have another another guy might have another criteria that. Uh, says, I just want to make sure that when the boss calls me into his office three months hence, I, I'm profitable, you know, that I've got my hurdle plus anything. Uh, so there's different criteria for different traders out there, and most people never really identify their criteria. I mean, the criteria for, let's say, a, a pension fund manager is going to be different than the criteria generally for uh, the individual speculator. And regardless of criteria, there's two supporting legs to that and the first one that is unavoidable uh, is is horizon and, and I can get into that more but the, the horizon how many periods you are seeking to satisfy this criterion over is is absolutely essential you know absent that you really are going to have trouble satisfying that criterion and I don't like that but that's just the way the math of this works out. And the second is, let's say, uh, t to what degree of confidence uh, do you want your solution to this criterion to be? So that's really the, the, the basis behind uh, anything in money management, I think. The detailing that criterion and along with that, over how many holding periods, over what time period are you looking to, to satisfy that criterion over? Right, so most people would know you for your work on Optimal F. So can you explain a little bit about this concept and how it relates to position sizing? Sure. Uh, Optimal F is a, is, is, is a fraction of an account, let's say, to expose to risk such that one would uh, maximize their expected geometric growth. And that too is a function of horizon, and I'll explain shortly. When I say it's the point that maximizes growth, it implies that there's a, a curve, and it would be the high point of the curve. And the important thing about that is there is a, a curve with uh, certain points on it of geometric importance to the trader, depending on their criterion. And uh, the peak, of course, is, is, is one of the most essential, well, it's the most essential point in defining the shape of that curve. Uh, when I say that horizon is important in terms of optimal F, in terms of maximizing expected growth, let's go back to that two to one coin toss game we were talking about earlier, the you know, 0.5 probability. We could say that, oh, the optimal F on this is 0.25. The expected growth uh, maximizing fraction to risk on this is 25%. That's only true as the number of periods or the number of plays approaches infinity. If we were to play this for one play, I say, Andrew, we're going to toss a coin here. If it comes up heads, you win $2. If it comes up tails, you're going to pay me a dollar. What fraction of your stake do you risk to maximize what you would expect to make on it? And the answer is 100%. If we're going to quit at two plays, now it's a lot less than 100%. And if we're to quit at an infinite number of plays, it converges asymptotically to this peak of this curve of 0.25. So when you said the, the peak in the curve is the most important point, are you talking about, um, is that the most important point for optimal growth? For, for expected geometric growth, yes. Right, so what if, um, what if your criterion is perhaps to manage your drawdowns i know we have we have some prop traders who listen to the podcast and i guess their focus and for other people you know others that manage money for other people um their focus is probably more on keeping the drawdowns lower rather than getting a huge return so how does the how does this optimal f concept adjust to a different criterion okay well let's say Drawdown is a different animal altogether, and, and it, it too is horizon specific, but if I may, uh, rather than addressing drawdown, let's, let's say I want to trade such that I have a floor uh, on the account value at let's say 80%, okay, of where we are today. So I'm not, I'm not addressing drawdown per se, but I am in fact practicing, let's say, a degree of portfolio insurance. 
and we're trading one component, and it's our two to one coin toss, as it would be. Okay, and again, this is just a simple analog for a discrete distribution of outcomes from trading. And in this case, it's just one component, but for simplicity. And we say, you know, I don't know what in the hell my horizon is. I plan to live a long time and just keep on trading and trading and trading. So my horizon is going to be the asymptotic value, 0.25. Okay, that's fine. So we're going to start out and you're going to want to risk 0.25. But you look and you say, you know, but I really can't exceed uh, dropping below 80%. Well, now you can't trade 0.25. You can trade 0.2, and if you lose on that first play, you're down 80%. And what we have is, as one loses money, one covers a path from the peak or some point less than the peak towards zero as the equity in the account diminishes. And as the equity in the account increases, that path increases, uh, the amount you are committing, the fraction you are committing, increases towards the optimal point. So we're no longer on just a single point on the curve, but we're actually traversing a path on the curve. And, and that's very important in understanding this, because some criteria, let's say expected growth maximization, requires us just being at a, at a stationary point. Other criteria require traversing a path through this surface. And as I say, the surface itself, or in this case, the surface is one dimensional because it's only one component, uh, can be solved through some very complicated mathematical and co computer processes, or we can estimate it very simply. So talking about this curve, uh, how do you, or, or what part of a, a system actually dictates the shape of that curve? Right. Well, actually, the distribution of outcomes dictates that curve. And, 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 and so for one component, we have a two-dimensional, we just have a two-dimensional curve, like a curve we draw on a piece of paper. And it's bound on the left at zero and on the right at one, and representing the fraction of our stake we would risk. And I translate that into a number of units, whether they're shares or futures, or whatever, by dividing the largest loss of a system by that fraction. So if my largest loss is, oh, let's say I'm trading a system and the largest loss is, uh, oh, $1,750, okay, and my optimal left is 0.27, so I have a number of 6,481. So for every 6,481 in account equity, uh, I'm going to trade one unit, one contract, or 100 shares, or, or, or whatever, uh, to, to go from a fraction to a number of units that represent that fraction. Uh, if we trade two components, we have two axes that are aligned at 90 degrees to each other, uh, both bound at, well, it, it bound at zero, zero, and then I go around it uh, clockwise, I'd be at zero, one, 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 zero, and back to zero, zero. And within that uh, field within that that manifold, I have a curve in 3D space, and that curve would have a peak. Let's say I'm trading two coin tosses that pay two to one. Now my peak in that curve is 0 0.23, 0 0.23, and so if I trade n games, I have a peak in n plus one space, or I have a surface in n plus one space that has a, a unique peak to it. And another rule of thumb regarding, let's say, the peaks is this. In the absence of negatively correlated instruments, which are virtually impossible to find and put us into a different universe, we find that the sum of the F values, as the number of components increase, that peaks out at one. So if I have one coin that pays two to one, and I have a curve in 2D space, the peak's at 0.25. If I have two of these games simultaneously, I have a peak at 0 0.23, 0 0.23, or the sum of that is 0.46. So, I mean, if both come up losers here, I'm down 46% on the first simultaneous play. Now, as I keep adding more components, 
more games to it, uh, I find that the sum of the F values peaks out at 1, uh, which is quite interesting because it says ultimately that the optimal F for a large portfolio of stocks is, is a full 100% commitment. But it also helps in terms of rules of rules of thumb on these things, along with the earlier rule we discussed of you know taking the probability of a winning outcome and dividing by two. Uh, as I add components to that, that diminishes for the individual component, such that the sum of all those components peaks out at one. Right. Okay. I think you may have uh, just touched on this a little already, but I'll just ask just for clarification. So you've said that the curve or the surface is created by the distribution of returns. So uh, should it be recalculated after every trade? Uh, not really. I mean, unless, unless that grossly alters the distribution of returns. I, ideally, I mean, in an ideal world, you estimate your distribution of returns, and as the returns come in, they fall within... Uh, what you expect given that distribution. We get events like 2008 and everybody's distribution goes out the window, which is also why, let's say we, we build a distribution off of past empirical data. I personally choose to amend that to be not quite as uh, benevolent as the past. Right, okay. So I guess that's um, probably one of the main criticisms with Optimal F is that um, it's based on historical data and you never really know when the, the biggest loss is going to hit you. So how do you account for that? Well, two things. Uh, first of all, this is part of why I've been pursuing more robust methods. Like let's say this probability, uh, the sum of the probabilities of the winning outcomes divided by two is a best guess estimate. Uh, for where things will be in the future, because now it's totally dependent on what the probability of winning trades is or winning uh, holding periods is in the future, which can, can be fairly accurately modeled. Okay, I mean, let's say a trend following system might win 30% of the time uh, over any considerably long time period. If my future is a considerably long time period, I would expect. 30% of those trades to be winners. And if it's the only system I'm trading and my criterion is to maximize expected geometric growth, then I'll take that 0.3 divided by 2 and say, oh, 0.15 is my best guess for the fraction I should risk on this to be expected growth optimal for an infinite number of plays on this. Now, the largest loss comes in in terms of translating that uh, fraction into a number of shares of contract. And I, I myself find that it's it, it pays to use other instruments to rather cement that in, whether it be options or, or, or anything along those lines, to cement in what that largest loss is. I mean, tail risk is something everybody's concerned with and dealing with these days, and yeah. there's you know, various ways to address that. But it is critical. You know, you don't, if you get a new largest loss in there, you're going to lose your footing, you'll lose your balance. And I think that's true of anything. All right. So that was interesting that you said that if there's something that adjusts the distribution of returns, that's probably when it should be uh, recalculated. I think so. I mean, 2008, certainly everyone had to go back and rethink everything after that. Yeah. You have already touched upon the nature of the curve, but I'd just like to ask a little bit more on that. I've got a quote here that you made in the IFTA journal, okay. if I can just read that to okay. you. It says, the optimal F calculation provides a bounded context for studying the nature of the curve whose optimal point, i.e. the peak, represents the correct fraction of a stake to risk to result in the greatest geometric growth asymptotically. It is the nature of the curve whose bounding allows us to study the different phenomena of the curve as well as provide a context from which we pursue criteria other than mere growth maximization. Yes. So I never said that. I never said that. Oh, you didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, a different route fits, yeah, was it? I didn't say that. <laughs> 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 so you've already mentioned a little bit about the, the shape of the curve. I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit more and about the practical applications of that. Sure. I mean, uh, again, I, I get back to criterion uh, as dictating what we should do on that curve. I, the peak, that optimal F point, as I call it, or that you could call it the Kelly criterion point, which is a, uh, 
a non-scaled optimal f point is, is a critical point, but there, there's other critical points on here. One of them, of course, is, is the inflection point. And, and the curve tends, as we increase the fraction away from zero, it's accelerating to the upside. And at some point before it reaches the peak, that acceleration diminishes. And we go from, a, let's say, something that's concave up to concave down. There is, there is a point of inflection that is less than the peak, which would represent where marginal increasing gains diminish with respect to marginal increase in risks. And I think that's a critical point for money managers. Another critical point that is shy of the peak and may actually be the optimal point for most traders aggressively uh, would be that point that maximizes gain with respect to drawdown. And we know that drawdown is linearly correlated to F value. That is, the greater the F value, the greater the drawdown. So let's use the F value as a proxy for drawdown. And, and, and that's probably a pretty accurate one because as soon as the largest loss is hit, we're going to see at least an F percent drawdown. And if we, if we draw a straight line from 0, 0, that would be tangent to the curve, that point of tangency is somewhere shy of the peak. But that point of tangency represents greatest growth with respect to drawdown, greatest growth with respect to risk. And, and many traders would say, well, this, this is your optimal point, not, not exactly the peak, but this tangent point here. And a, a fourth very critical point is a point right of the peak where the curve drops below 1.0. The altitude of the curve represents what we make uh, on our stake as a multiple. And if that multiple drops below one, then what we make on our stake over those periods is a number less than one. And here's where it gets very interesting and into all kinds of other applications. Just as we have an F value between zero and one, we can also say that, well, I don't, I, I bet I don't want to get into that that geometry. That's really, that's, that, this is going to go off on a bad tangent here, Andrew. It's going to be very time <laughs> consuming and really not germane to uh, what a trader's interest would be in it. Yeah, let's, let's leave that as going off in a, in a bad direction there. Well, maybe we can uh, move into multiple strategies in a portfolio because many traders look to reduce their risk by diversifying with other strategies or into different markets. So what impact does this type of diversification have on risk? Oh, it's a great idea. I mean, if I can trade multiple strategies and multiple components, uh, oftentimes I'll get a better diversification than just with multiple components. Let's say I'm trading just the trend following system. Let's say just some type of channel breakout system. Uh, I can trade that on, let's say, five different markets. Or let's say I trade five different systems on one market. And those five different systems are quite disparate indeed. They're not all trend following systems. It's a lot easier to find low correlations on the same component between different systems than it is to find low correlations on the same system between different components as a general rule. I mean, it's not always the case, but anytime you can add more viable systems, you're better off. Right. So what if you, um, if you do have multiple systems, does the optimal position size for a single strategy change when you're including these other strategies in a portfolio? Oh, absolutely. The shape of the curve remains the same, but the peak is going to be at a different location. And hence, those other two points we mentioned, the inflection point and the growth risk maximizing point, those will change as well because those tend to orbit the peak. Uh, so there, it's going to change as well. But again, there's some pretty good heuristic rules for estimating uh, the shape of this surface, given uh, the, the probability of winning outcomes for these various markets and systems. And, and, and we would say, okay, the shape is going to change, but it's, it's readily calculable. So from a, a money management point of view, though, should multiple strategies be managed separately or, sh or are you saying that they need to be managed as an entire portfolio? Well, I, I, I put them in as a, I aggregate them together. 
and, and, and if, you, if you separate them, there's a little bit of an efficiency loss. You can do that, although you do lose a little bit of efficiency by doing that. You're a little better off to aggregate them together. All right. Thanks, Ralph. I'd just like to um, move on to the listener questions because we've got quite a few to cover. But first, I just want to ask you a general question. So your first book came out, I think, in 1990. Have your ideas or how you apply them changed over the past uh, 25 years? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, at first, I was uh, solely interested in the peak and solely interested in the asymptotic effect of that. And I since come to realize that the, the whole story is in the, the curve, the shape of the surface, and how we move about or position ourselves on that surface to satisfy whatever criterion we're looking to satisfy. It's a much broader application than just saying, I want to go and make the most on this money, I'm willing to lose it all, and uh, you know, draw down, be damned. So, I mean, that's clearly a, a big change from, uh, you know, back in the late 80s when I was putting that together originally. So what caused that change in your understanding? Oh, age. Age. <laughs> <laughs> Everything just slows down a little. <laughs> no, I mean, the more, the more I looked at it, the more I looked at it, the broader it became. And, and the, more, the more critical, again, the idea of horizon and criteria became. The more I looked at this, I said, okay, this is applicable. Every single trader out there could use this to his benefit. His, his biggest impediment to doing so is being able to articulate his criterion, which also means articulating what his horizon is. And if you can get past that, you got half of this lick. The calculation aspect is not hard. The theory of how to apply that calculation aspect is not hard. The biggest obstacle is determining really what what is your criteria? What are you what is it you seek to gain here? And for the individual, that's particularly difficult. Like I said, for a pension fund, that's very straightforward. Hmm. For an individual, it's very difficult for the individual to say, oh, my criterion is this. And it's not easy. Yeah, that's a great tip to um, have a, a good understanding of your criterion uh, first before you go through all this stuff. It really helps with the outcome. Yeah. All right. So, well, um, thanks for that, Ralph. We'll just move on to some listener questions. The first okay. one is from Patrick. I'll just read it to you. It says, okay. some strategy developers have argued that after testing myriads of position sizing algorithms, one of the surprisingly most efficient ways to protect from a system breaking down is to stop trading when the equity curve is below its 200-day moving average. What are your thoughts? Uh, I've tested those kinds of ideas out quite a bit. And I found it to be a case of uh, six and one half dozen of the other. So they say, I mean, it helps in some situations. In some situations, it hurts. Uh, again, I look at things in terms of a path in this manifold, in this leverage space manifold on that surface. So if you're saying... I'm going to stop trading at such and such a point, okay? You're, you're actually traversing a path on there where at some point the path just ends. It, it, it can work, but there are times where this, this idea won't work. You know, you'll, you'll pay a price for it. But again, if, if we look at just past data, we could, we could curve fit anything, especially to the, the 2008 episode, uh, and say, oh, at, at, you know, at, at any... 30% drop, we shut down trading altogether. And there's a lot of stuff out there to that effect. But not knowing that beforehand, I think uh, you're, you, know, you could hurt yourself with it as well. Right, okay. And there was a second point to Patrick's question, actually. It says, if we assume a strategy will lose its edge at some point, how do you identify that point and protect yourself? Well, you have to be monitoring the outcomes of the trades to whether they comport to this given distribution or not. I've done a, a, a lot of work along those lines with uh, particularly at some of the stuff of uh, Abraham Wald, who had a book in, I think it was in 1944, called Sequential Analysis. And, I, I, and I'm still working on that. I don't have the, the answer to that. That's just the direction I'm looking at in terms of solving that is at what point do the trades 
no longer comport to the distribution, the expected distribution of outcomes. And, and I think that's very, much, very similar to, let's say, Wald's book that tries to address uh, things from a manufacturing perspective, let's say. We make widgets, they come down an assembly line. Uh, the 11th widget is defective. The 17th widget is defective. At what point do we say there's a problem with our manufacturing process here, that things aren't coming along as expected? How do we identify that point as early as possible with some type of mathematical justification? And again, I would say uh, you probably want to study uh, some of Wald's stuff for that. I don't have that solved yet. I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if Patrick, if Patrick gets it before I do, I certainly hope he shares it with me. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. So the next question is from Sean. He says, if you have read Howard Bandy's new book, Quantitative Technical Analysis, what is your opinion on the safe F position sizing described therein? I, I have to confess I haven't read it. I, I should have. I just haven't read it yet. And then it's the first I've heard of it. All right. We'll move on to the next question, which is from Vickers. Okay. Uh, his question is, um, what are some proven optimal money management strategies to take a small account to a large account? I think this one uh, ties into Larry Williams' story as well. Right, exactly. I mean, if 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 you want to do that, uh, I would say to trade it at the optimal level, and I would say that if you're looking to trade one component, you could quite simply say, "What's my probability of winning trade divided by two? Take that result and divide your largest loss by it, and that gives you a number to trade. Uh, how much money to put behind each contract, or or number of shares or units uh, to trade it, but Again, if you're going to do it at that level, you better be ready to be wiped out and at the very least for some very wild swings. <laughs> right, yeah. It's, um, it is. It's a very wild it's a very wild ride. You know, you're not going to get there on a straight line. So is that uh, is that how Larry Williams increased his 10k to a million plus? Yes. In 1987? Yeah. Yes. So I think he said he had a 900% drawdown. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty. It was, it was a, it's a wild ride. It's a very wild ride. And here's the thing. The better the system, the higher the F value. And the higher that F value is, when the largest losses hit, you're going to see at least an F percent drawdown. So the better the system in this type of approach and trying to satisfy this criterion, the more severe you can expect your drawdown to be. <laughs> It's, it's kind of paradoxical in that sense, but that's the way it works out. I guess there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? No, 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 no. no. In fact, I don't think you want to have lunch with that strategy at all. <laughs> I just yeah. keep the bag handy and forget the lunch. <laughs> you won't feel like eating when you see the drawdown. No, no, I get one of those little bags in the front seat, the seat right in front of you there. Just hang on to that. <laughs> 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 All right. The next question is from Ola. Okay. Um, Ola asks, I'd like to hear his views on dynamic position sizing with respect to a strategy's performance. If you measure the performance of a strategy by the performance of recent trades, can you improve the performance and or limit the risk taking by adjusting the position sizing accordingly? Well, okay. When she speaks of, let's say, improving performance, and I say, okay, what does that mean? to Ola. What does she mean by improving performance? Again, it's a function of criteria. Let's say Ola's criterion is to uh, maximize the probability that her equity curve will be at a new high equity. And so what Ola does is uh, she, she does things dynamically and as, a, as the system uh, loses money she tends to commit more money to each subsequent trade up to the optimal F value. So let's say she starts out at a very, oh, very modest position size. Let's say her optimal F is 0.25, but she starts out at 0 0.03. Minimize her drawdown. She has a couple losing periods, some losing trades. That 0.03 is now 0.1, and things are still going sour and so forth. Uh, eventually, she's, let's say, all the way out at 0.25, the optimal amount, which, uh, you know, if, if the system does anything like it did in the past, you will quickly recoup that the accumulated loss here. So it's, it's a case of, okay, her path, which is, a, by the way, the exact opposite direction of the uh, insured portfolios path we just mentioned earlier in this discussion where we 
start at a point and move towards zero as losses accrue, okay? Here she's starting near zero and moving towards the peak as losses accrue. Uh, th th this type of dynamic strategy would help satisfy her criteria, which I'm hypothetically stating here as uh, maximizing her probability of being uh, at, at high equity at some arbitrary future point. Right, okay, thanks. So uh, next question is from Brian. Okay. He says, Ralph, I admire your work. My question is about Martingale strategies. Probability theory suggests that using Martingale methods in money management is a gambler's fallacy. However, I've heard that some very successful hedge funds employ Martingale strategies to double down against losing positions. Have you ever or do you use any Martingale strategies and do they make sense? Yeah, they, they do make sense. Uh, they have a place in things. But again, this is in many ways like the 200-day uh, the moving average on the equity curve. There are times where it could really burn you as well. If you were trading, let's say, a Martingale strategy uh, throughout the 1990s, you would have far outperformed uh, what you know, a fully invested portfolio might have seen. Uh, so it, it, it's the kind of thing that in the right market environment, in a congestive market environment, you're, you'd be much better off because you're buying more at lower prices. But in a runaway market, you're going to pay a, a pretty steep price for that. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, the next question is from James. Um, his question is, which of Ralph's books would he recommend for someone whose eyes immediately glaze over when mathematics is discussed? Oof, you know, I don't, I think the original one, Portfolio Management Formulas, has the least uh, math in it and, and, and covers the concept pretty, pretty basically. Uh, unfortunately, they, they all have a good degree of math. The latest one, uh, the Risk Opportunity Analysis, I tried to write in such a way that uh, one didn't have to delve into the math, although the math is presented. And that's pretty thorough. So he's probably better off with that. But read it with an eye towards disregarding the math. Because, again, the math can all either be run by computer or calculated with heuristics that you could, you know, perform quickly in your head. So to James, I'd say, don't, don't let yourself get hung up on the math of it. But do cover it for the principles. I mean, we discussed for the inflection point and, and, and so forth. Right, okay. And we've got another question from James, actually. Okay. He says, um, I think Ralph had a role in Larry Williams' position sizing model as released in his Long-Term Secrets to Short-Term Trading book uh, 15 years ago, where everything, position sizing, revolved around the largest historical loss. Given the markets are now virtually open 24 hours a day and that the weekend is the only time a nasty gap could strike, does Ralph think that uh, think one can dispense with that safety valve and be a little more aggressive with position sizing? Uh, well, well, first of all, just to back up real quickly, I wouldn't say that a weekend is the only time a nasty gap uh, could strike. We could have a nasty gap strike right in the middle of the trading day. The mechanics of the marketplaces now are, are such that this could happen. And, and, and just because we haven't seen it doesn't mean we couldn't have, let's say, an instantaneous print of, uh, you know, minus a thousand Dow points here, middle of the day. Uh, we don't have a specialist system that works anymore. We have a, a, a ERSAT specialist system through high frequency trading. There's also some very, very nasty feedback mechanisms as a result of uh, leveraged structured products nowadays that's uh, at work in the shadows here. And uh, I'm, I'm as afraid uh, on a minute to minute basis of a nasty gap as I am over the weekend. I, I would say, no, we can't, we, we certainly can't dispense of uh, largest losing trade. And, and think of it as worst case outcome. What's the worst case that can happen? If, if you're just using largest losing trade historically, you may not uh, be enough, okay? But a uh, largest or worst case outcome, I would certainly know. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm long uh, some volatility puts, okay? I know my worst case outcome is going to be 
uh, the amount of the, the premium of those puts and so forth. So I can truly truncate my worst case outcome, but I absolutely can't can't dispense with it. I mean, especially now. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, a question from Ryan, which I think you've already covered. Uh, what fraction of optimal F does he recommend as advisable? Oh, I mean, that's a function of the system itself. Okay, the distribution of outcomes. What other systems are being traded with it? Because let's say I trade a thousand components, a thousand different markets and systems. I know that the sum of the F values is going to total up towards one or a hundred percent. But that assumes that my criteria is just straight up maximizing expected geometric growth. And, uh, you know, if, if that's the point, then you, the optimal left value suggested could be more than 25%. And as I say, what's important when you're trading more than one component, more than one market or system, is it the individual F values, but their summation, because that's the percentage drawdown you're going to see if worst case is manifest among all those components at once, which is always a possibility. Um, now, a question from David. Uh, he asks, please ask Ralph to explain in non-technical language how an intelligent advisor or investor could put uh, your ideas or one or two of your ideas into practice. Okay, well, let's say uh, I'm trading oh, N components, okay? I have N different markets and systems. Now, for each of these N markets and systems, I'm going to figure out what the probability of a winning month is or a winning whatever my holding period is for each one of these. And I'm going to divide that by two, okay? Now, I'm going to take each of those results and I'm going to divide them by N. And I'll explain why I divide them by N uh, afterwards. This tells me now what the peak of uh, the landscape is in this N plus one dimensional landscape. And from that peak, I can craft what I would want for my criteria. Now, why did I divide them all by N? Okay, if I say, you know, I want to be ready for worst case every where all the correlations go to one and everything goes crazy because the more, the more a given market makes a big move, the more other markets at the same time will make a big move. And the more the big moves tend to move together. So the more a given market makes a big move, the more correlations tend to migrate towards one. If I have correlations that have migrated, if, if the correlation of everything is one, then I don't want to be summing my F values. Let me, let me try and explain it this way. Let's go back to that two to one coin toss game here, Andrew. If I'm doing one of these, so I'm going to take just one, one, one of these at a time, my asymptotic peak, my F value is 0.25. If I do two of these very same games simultaneously, my peak is at 0 0.23, 0 0.23, or a sum of 0.46. That assumes that those two games are totally independent. And if I keep adding independent games, the sum of those F values for all those games simultaneously will tend towards one. However, in the case of two coins, they're independent, and my peak is at 0 0.23, 0 0.23, 0 0.4 total aggregate exposure. If those coins, let's say, happen to be perfectly correlated, and I don't know this, then the actual peak is at 0 0.125, 0 0.125, or the same as playing one game at 0.25. But I'm at point, I'm way beyond the peak. Okay, that last 0.21 of exposure I've taken on, I'm actually paying a price for it. I'm having less return, greater drawdown. I'm really hanging out on this. So if the correlations all go to one, okay, I want to trade however many coins I'm trading right at 0.25, okay? Similarly, this is why I'm dividing all of these components. Uh, first, I'm dividing the probability of a winning holding period by 
by 2, and then I'm taking that result and dividing them by the number of components. And this gives me my estimated peak in this landscape should correlations all go to 1. Now, depending on what his criteria is, okay, would determine what we do with this information. If his criteria is, you know, I really want to maximize my probability of or being profitable uh, at an arbitrary point in time, he's going to migrate from uh, an area close to zero, zero, zero towards that peak. If, if, if his criteria is to truncate drawdown point, he's going to migrate from the peak towards zero, zero, zero as losses accumulate. So from this simple calculation, he can, he can determine where the peak is in a very conservative sense, in a sense of uh, this is the peak when all hell breaks loose, and, 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 and craft, craft a framework, craft, craft a path through that to satisfy whatever his criterion is. I, I hope that's a simple enough explanation. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thanks, uh, Ralph. So I'll just uh, finish up with one last reader question. This one's from Vickers as well. He wants to know your thoughts on betting more aggressively with the profits of the year. So he says, let's say I'm up 20% for the year. Now, instead okay. of betting, say, 1% of the 120%, which is the new account balance, okay. what if I bet 1% of the original capital and then 20% of the profits, basically aggressive, um, you know, an aggressive idea to grow capital? So what do you think about that type of approach? Well, I mean, again, it depends on what his criterion is. Uh, if his, uh, you know, his, his criterion maybe, let's say he's up 20% on the year, uh, his criterion might be if, if, he, if he's, let's say, oh, he's trading on a prop desk and if he shows a 20% gain this year, he, he's king of the floor, mm. he, he won't want to do this. If uh, he's an individual trader, this might sit very well with him. You know, there's a big psychological difference between trading with money that has been accrued through recent gains versus money that you've put on the table. And it's, it's a lot easier to be more aggressive with accrued profits than with, uh, you know, the, the money you're playing defensively with that you put on the table. So yeah, that's a very viable idea for a guy who's looking to trade aggressively. That it doesn't violate what his criteria calls for. Yeah, he originally asked the question about uh, money management strategies to take a small account to a large account. So I assume that means that his criteria is growth. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So certainly that 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 could well work. Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks, Ralph. So I'd just like to uh, wrap up with a few quick closing questions. Okay. Uh, the first one: What's the biggest lesson you've learned through trading? Oh, th things are not what they appear. I, this has been a, a learning process for me from the, the get-go, and I, I, I think you know, even in this discussion, there's some questions here that pertain to things I'm still working on, still, still trying to solve for myself, uh, and, and certain things that I'm, 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 I've grown to be quite certain of, like the idea of uh, the necessary for criterion. Along with that is also the idea that you really can't accept things because they are uh, mathematically accepted or mathematical given. Remember you spoke of how a criterion is everything in this, and that's a function of horizon. And we said, well, even drawdown, the calculation for drawdown or ruin is a function of horizon. And belying all of this is the idea of expectation, uh, what you expect to make which is a function of horizon. And let me give you a quick example. Let's go back to our coin toss example, our two to one coin toss example. And I'm going to throw in a third possible outcome that the coin lands exactly on its side. Okay. And if that happens, Andrew, you're going to pay me a million dollars. Okay. So <laughs> you can win two dollars if it's heads, lose one dollar if it's tails, or lose a million dollars if it lands on its side. Okay. Do you want to play the game? And if so, how many times do you want to play it? Okay. <laughs> and you might say, well, win $2, I, I'll, I'll play it all day long. That coin's not going to land on its side. Okay. And 
that that's probably very true. If we played a million times, it might land on its side one time, though. And classical expectation tells us, no, this is a losing game. Don't play it. And Andrew says, what the hell? I'm playing it three times. It's not going to land on its side. I'm going to play it three times, and uh, I'm going to make some money on this. So the idea then becomes, okay, for a given horizon, is is the, the far outliers, do, do, do we even expect those to come into play? And the answer is no. Uh, we don't expect them to come into play because there's not a, we don't have the principle of ergodicity at work. As individual traders trading over, let's say, Q future periods, there's no such thing as, as ergodicity here, where if, if we say, okay, a million guys are going to come and do this coin toss thing, and each guy's going to only play three times, some guys are going to get zinged, and it's going to land on its side, okay? But for you, Andrew, you're not concerned about those other guys. You're concerned about Andrew over three, three coin tosses, so yep. you're really not concerned about that thing coming up on its side. And this idea, by the way, I contend, is what belies uh, much of what human beings do contrary to what classical expectation tells us human beings should do. It's the reason why uh, you will get in your car and you will drive to the office today, even though you can get killed doing it. You don't expect to get killed driving to your office today, okay? You, you really expect that, well, you know, if I was going to do it 10 million times, yeah, I'll, I'll get killed doing it, but I'm not going to be doing it 10 million times. Uh, and, and so, this, this idea of, of stopping times in mathematics and, and, and classical expectation really do not pertain to us as individual traders. And this is really very important, and it too is a function of, of criterion. So let's, I'll just wrap up here, but let's go back to that coin toss and say, you know, Andrew, you want to play this thing a hundred times. It's, you're convinced it's not going to land on its side, okay, because a hundred times is uh, way too small of a sample space uh, to worry about it coming up and landing on its side. So what are you going to do to maximize uh, what you expect to make? And, and what you would do then is you would say, well, you know, I'm going to completely disregard that, that outlier, that one in a million chance of this coin landing on its side, and I'm going to figure, hey, it's going to come up heads with a probability of 0.5 and tails with a probability of 0.5, and that, that's it, because uh, coming up on its side is just not in, 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 in my field of view here. And you then change the distribution uh, 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 of outcomes that you're using as input to the calculation of this landscape. And that's a good point you bring up about mathematical expectations, so thanks for raising that one. Second question, what's the hardest part of trading? Oh, there's, 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 there's really two parts to it. I mean, for me, the first part, uh, and, and these are both psychological. And the first part is uh, taking heat on a sizable position, and and you know that's that's never easy. That's never fun, and you have to console yourself uh, that okay, I've been through this in the past. You know, I've been through 2008. I had this horror story, and I survived that. Uh, and that's never fun. And I try to have positions going on uh, for, you know, long positions, short positions. My goal is if the day is moving big in one direction, I should be taking profit on something that, uh, you know, I, I, I sowed at some earlier point. Which also means uh, I'm taking heat on another position. And that's always difficult. The other part is... Uh, that uh, along with this, there's there's the requirement of patience. You know, lots of times these markets just meander like a lifeboat. You know, out on a dead ocean, they go nowhere. You know, especially summer months are notorious for that. You know, I'm not saying we're in that right now, but you know, there are times where things just meander and go nowhere. And again, you have to look at what happened in the past and say, okay, this is not a this is not a permanent condition here. So I try to keep available charts of what has happened in the past when I've taken heat on things or when things have meandered and gone nowhere. And when I really I find myself in a tough psychological situation like that, just go look at those charts. Just remind yourself, okay, you've been through this before. This is what happens. This is how this one turned out. This is how that one turned out. 
Here's the one we almost froze to death in Boston, waiting to catch the tea to meet the margin call. But you lived. <laughs> you lived. <laughs> you look like Scott of the Antarctic out there, but you made it. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> is that why you moved to Florida, to get away yeah, from the, is, the cold weather? That yes. that, that Boston experience just about did me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. It's, it's, Sorry, were you finished? No, no, no. I, 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 there, there is a funny story along with that, but that'll wait for another time. <laughs> oh well, you're welcome to share it if you like. No, no, no. We can, we we kind of touched upon it there already. It had to do with with cold weather and a margin call in Boston, and that was that. <laughs> okay, but you survived, so that's I it. Survived that's, it. Yeah. <laughs> So one one final trading question. What's the best trading advice you have ever received? Uh, you know, you got to keep coming back. You know, you really can't let this thing defeat you. At some point, everybody finds their groove with it if they stick around long enough. But it takes a while. It took me a long time. Now, I was really lucky. I had exposure to some great traders I mean, just some great traders, there's some great systems, there's some great ideas. And even at that, it took me a long time to find my groove with this, to find out what works for Ralph, okay, uh, in terms of uh, to satisfy my criterion, in terms of a, a trading style that, that fit me. And, and I think I concluded, you know, everybody's different, okay. Uh, there's certain truths out there. I mean, one of the truths is you, you're somewhere in this manifold uh, that we've discussed. And you're in there at a point and probably moving around on it and you're paying the consequences and reaping the benefits of that inadvertently. Uh, so why not use that to your benefit? Okay. So, I mean, there's certain truths to things, but what your criterion is and, and how you satisfy that uh, isn't necessarily the same as mine. And everybody has to find their own groove with this. And that, that just takes time. And if it doesn't, then you're a very fortunate man. So you mentioned that you had uh, exposure to a number of trading experts. Who do you think um, had the, the greatest impact on your trading experience? Oh, without a doubt, Larry did. Larry Williams. Uh, and, and he knew everybody, so there was a lot of cross-pollinization going there. But uh, this is a guy who didn't sleep. Okay, this is a guy. He didn't sleep. He he didn't. He did not leave a stone unturned. You know, had I not had the good fortune of running into him, Andrew, I think I'd be you know punching the time clock at the uh, Ford engine plant here right about now uh, to start the night shift. I, I, yeah. I was really very fortunate to have run into that guy. He was a a free thinker. And part of his free thinking spawned a thread, an avenue that I went down in my life without realizing I was going down it. That opened up all kinds of doors. And, you know, had I not done that, I wouldn't have encountered you. We wouldn't be having this discussion. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm really very grateful to, to have met the guy, you know, and, and to have had his influence on my life, which has been a lot more profound uh, than, than just the trading ideas even, which were profound enough. It's funny how things happen like that. They they can take you down a different path altogether. So and you don't you don't see it when it's when it's upon you. I don't. Yeah. Really. <laughs> Do you wake up and say, "Holy crap! How did I get here?" Yeah, oh yeah, every day, <laughs> every day when I see that cinder block on my chest of those positions that keep adding up against me, you know, another <laughs> cinder block. I think, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think of Larry? Do you blame Larry oh, for that? Oh, yeah, I do. I blame him every day. <laughs> I'd have been so much happier if I was just punching the clock right about now. <laughs> well, we won't mention it to Larry. <laughs> um, so do you have a favorite trading book? Uh, I have a number of them, you know, uh, and, 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 and they're all pretty old. But I do have a lot of them and some that I've read recently. Uh, that, that, you know, I, I've really, really enjoyed. I think uh, one of the ones I really enjoyed a lot was was, was Prechter's book on, on Elliott Wave, just because of the way it got me thinking about things in a lot of ways. You know, I liked the old Wells Wilder book because it was so mechanical. And at the time, 
you know, the, 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 the personal computer was just coming on. Here was some very mechanical approaches, and, and so many things have, been, have spawned off of that. So these are some of the, some of my favorite books out there. And of course, the, the two, uh, the, the real cornerstones of technical analysis to me are uh, the, 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 the uh, chart craft point and figure book, and, and of course the the Bible, Edwards and McGee. It's the uh, I have to go back to that all the time just to to reread it. It's, it has everything in there. Yeah. And uh, final question, what's the best way for listeners to get in touch with you? Uh, probably send an email through uh, the lspindexes.com site. There's a contact page on there. If you go if you went to www.lspindexes.com, you can reach me that way. That will get forwarded on to me where, wherever uh, I am at that time. Oh, that's great. So thanks so much for your time today, Ralph. Is there anything else you'd like to mention before we wrap up today? No, thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, hopefully I'll get the chance to meet you in person in the next year or so. Yeah, come on out to Australia. Will do. Just don't come in the wintertime. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> so, so thanks a lot again for your time today. I know you're a busy man, but um, I highly recommend everyone check out Ralph's books. I'll have links to those in the show notes for this episode. So, yeah, thanks again for your time today, Ralph. I appreciate it. You too, Andrew. I've enjoyed it. Right, cheers. Okay, bye-bye. What a great chat with Ralph today. Who would have thought money management would be so much fun? I got some really great tips from him today. He really emphasized the importance of criteria. Whether you're aiming for maximum growth, limited drawdown, or somewhere in between, you really need to define exactly what it is that you're trying to achieve. Ralph said the biggest impediment was not being able to articulate your criteria. Another point that goes along with criteria is being able to define your horizon, as your position sizing will vary depending on how many periods you want to achieve your outcome. The final point was uh, traversing the curve to meet objectives. So we're all aware of the optimal left point, which is the peak of the point for maximum growth. But there is also other critical points on that curve that may be more appropriate depending on your criteria. If you head over to the show notes, Ralph has provided some charts or graphs which demonstrate the concepts uh, that we talked about today. The show notes for this episode are available at bettersystemtrader.com slash 11. We also have some other resources on that page, so uh, go check it out. Also, a big thank you to all the listeners who submitted questions for Ralph this week. If you'd like to submit a question of your own for future guests, make sure you're on the Better System Trader mailing list, and I'll send you an email when the next opportunity arises. You may also remember that this week we had a competition for Perry Kaufman's new book. Well, that competition is now closed, but at the time of this recording, Perry hasn't chosen a winner, so I can't announce it right now, but as soon as I find out, I'll be sending you an email, so keep an eye out. You could be the lucky winner. Anyway, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Ralph this week. Thanks for listening to Better System Trader. Catch you next week. Thanks for listening to the Better System Trader podcast. The next step is to head over to bettersystemtrader.com for more expert tips, practical advice, and exclusive content. Catch us next time for even more great ways to improve your trading here on Better System Trader.